preached that first uh, after Easter. Um, I had no idea, and I, this is not a, not a, probably not a good, uh, it's a good biblical sermon, it's probably not a good homiletically correct sermon. Uh, in those days, I had absolutely no understanding of what it took to be homiletically correct. I just wanted to say something that was meaningful, and I knew I would never have to do it again, so I just kind of worked on it just to get done what I had to do. And I did that, and here I am 60 years later, and I'm going to repeat that sermon. Um, I, uh, I do not memorize my sermons. I do not write all the sermon out. I've got a heavy outline. But uh, I think I've told you uh, the story. I had been preaching maybe a year, year and a half, two years maybe. And I, I had to preach in a Sunday morning service at the church where I was. And I had to preach somewhere else Sunday afternoon, somewhere else Sunday evening. I got back home and my wife said, Honey, when did you have time to prepare three sermons? I said, I didn't. That was the same sermon. She listened it all three times and thought it was a different sermon every time. So uh, I, I doubt seriously, I have, I have every doubt seriously that this sermon this morning is going to have very little resemblance to what was preached 60 years ago. But it, the, the, uh, the basic understanding of this message needs to get to all of us. Uh, disciples, I said last week uh, in the course of, of uh, preaching Easter sermons, uh, the disciples were um, more than uh, distraught because their leader had been destroyed. As far as they were concerned, he was dead, he was in a grave, and they, they didn't know what in the world they were going to do. Uh, they had little understanding of what was going to happen. After he went to the grave, they thought he was, I guess, was going to be the king forever, and he was going to be... Uh, be their guider and their leader all at once he's gone now what do we do and uh, so the, this message comes from from a, a, a background of trying to understand um, when you come to the crescendo of the Easter season uh, the birth of the Lord Jesus in December uh, if that's whatever year he was born whatever uh, uh, season of the year he was born uh, until uh, 33 years later we come to the uh, cross and he dies on, on a cross and is buried in a tomb um, we have to under, we have to try to figure out where do we go from here uh, sometimes when somebody a great leader dies uh, people are just ready to pull in the pull in the grave after them, they just go die with him because uh, it's the end of an era. Uh, and we have, uh, we have had presidents uh, that, that when, they, when they pass from this life all at once, we, we felt like, well, what do we do now? And, and the disciples were uh, in that mode when they woke up Easter Sunday morning and they were... Uh, assured that, that the, the grave had been sealed, the tomb was closed, uh, the stone had been there, uh, Mary goes down there to see and the stones rolled away. Uh, as far as the disciples were concerned, uh, it was the end, it was over. And, and, and we gotta figure out now, where do we go from here? Um, we, live in, uh, we live in the 21st century uh, 2,000 plus years from that day and there are still a lot of people in my world who are saying okay we had uh, the resurrection we had the Easter money we had all of this everything is done what do we do now uh, some people would say well we go back to the same old grind uh, Easter should bring to us not the same old grind but it should bring to us some new impetus as to what we accomplish or what we need to be accomplishing for God in the future. Uh, Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the 10th through the 20th verse, and this is not an Easter, Easter sermon, uh, and when it comes to those, that passage, but I, it, it, 
it is the core or the heart core, as far as I'm concerned, of what the church is expected to accomplish at, from Easter Sunday on. Uh, we, are, we are not to dwell at the tomb uh, because the Savior has gone. We don't dwell on, on, the, on the road with the Savior because he's gone from there. Uh, he, he is ascended into heaven, and he now sits at the right hand of the Father. But I want to, I, this, I don't normally read the whole passage, but I do want to read this passage this morning. Sixth chapter uh, of, of Ephesians, uh, beginning at the 10th verse. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, if you listen to this from the standpoint of what uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Ephesians, telling them what needs to happen. This is what needs to happen when, when we accept the, the Savior. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having a breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. For, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an, an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. As I, I I'm sure, I don't remember what I did 60 years ago, but as I read that passage, somehow it became clear to me that I had a responsibility, that the people that I was talking to had a responsibility to, in, in a sense, forget about the tomb. That's over. It's done. He's gone from there. He's not there. Uh, but we have a responsibility to, to, to continue the ministry which he had when he was here, and he said he came to seek and to save the lost. And so after Easter, what? After Easter is, get it in gear. Let's go. Let's go. We got we got we got a task to perform. We live uh, the Easter season in in contrast to the disciples in, in the early church. It's a climax for us. Uh, it was a climax for, for them. In, 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 but it, is, it should have been a beginning for us. Two things were given at the resurrection: ministry given to the living message, and given power with living message to conquer. Um, it's one thing to say that I have the ability to do something. It's uh, one thing to say that I have the power of God to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. It's another thing to see it put in gear. We, we've talked about walk the walk and talk the talk. Uh, there there, there are, are people who want to talk the talk, but when it comes down to it, uh, they have a little difficult, they have a little difficulty of, in walking the walk. This happens in business. This happens everywhere we go. There are, there are people in the educational world who can run their mouths about all education ought to be and should be and everything, and they never produce anything. They just never get around to getting it going. There are preachers who have, they talk about their call, and, and yet they have never put it in gear. They've never gotten going to do anything about it. Uh, there are people who talk about business, and I, I can tell you down through the years, uh, I, I'm older than most of you here. Uh, not my wife's older than me, she, but it, <laughs> I'm older than most of you. But uh, uh, I, I, it, it's, I, I watch business, I watch business people uh, who have failed time after time after time. Somehow they think, well, if I keep doing the same stuff, maybe it'll get better. If you keep doing the same thing, it's going to, the same thing's going to happen every time. It's just the way it is. In the ministry, if, if we 
do not seek a, a new opportunity or look for opportunities to minister in Jesus' name, uh, that's not going to just happen. It's not going to be accident. Uh, there have been times when I, I've gone back home and I've told my wife, I've said I've talked to a young man today and I think I was put in his path. I think, I honestly, I can't think of any other reason why I was there than to talk to him about his soul. I can't, couldn't think of another reason why I was there. And, and it was just an opportunity, not to preach to the kid, that wasn't it. But it was buying the opportunity to share with him the good news that Jesus can do what needs to happen if we'll let him do what needs to happen. And uh, so this morning we're going to look at after Easter what? Um, I broke this down into uh, uh, three sections. Uh, the disciples, the early church, and the church today. Uh, the disciples question and ask, Lord, is it now that you plan to set up your kingdom? Acts, the first chapter, the sixth verse. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, when things were beginning to get warmed up pretty good and everything was beginning to happen, the disciples said, oh, man, we're, we're, we're fixing to get on Easy Street right here. He's going to set up his kingdom. We're going to be, we're going to be sitting one on his right, one on his left. We're going to be in control. And, and all of a sudden, uh, along came the, uh, comes the uh, religious leaders, and they say, no, 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 no. We're going to eliminate this guy. We've got to stop him. And, and, and so things really began to turn. Uh, uh, no answer, but a command in Acts, the first chapter, the eighth and ninth verses, but ye shall receive power... After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Uh, the ascension was the was the um, the time what was the starting gun. Uh, it may have should have been before that. But when he was out there, they said, are you going to set up your kingdom? What are you going to do? And he told them what they needed to do and where they needed to go and what kind of power they needed to have and that the Holy Spirit was going to come. They got all of that straightened around and then he was taken up out of their sight. That was kind of like the starting gun. Okay, I'm gone. Let's go. You got, to, you got it becomes your responsibility. After Easter... It was a message that, I don't know, the Lord put that on my heart, I guess, uh, that, that there were so many people who uh, live from holiday to holiday or revival meeting to revival meeting, and, and we don't know exactly what to do when that is over. Uh, we have, uh, I, when I pastored at Townley, I was informed that a brother came from, uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, and held a three-week meeting, meant to hold one week of meeting, he held a three-week meeting, and, uh, and there was 200 and some people saved, and uh, that was about probably six, eight years before I got there, and, uh, and I said, where are they? There's not but 50 people here now. What happened to those people? Well, you, that, mm, you man, yeah. Uh, excuse. Uh, I'm not saying they didn't get saved. That, I didn't say that. I'm saying that because something great happens in a particular situation doesn't mean that it's just going to accidentally keep happening. We have to work at the task, sharing the gospel, sharing the message, talking to people, sharing with them God's love and faith uh, as we move along through life. And when he had spoken these things, while they, held, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. The second point I put down here is the church. It, it's, it's easy, sometimes it's easy for us to say, well, the disciples, you know, they had things pretty well. They're pretty good. He fed them. He walked with them. He talked with them. He fed the 5,000. Uh, so, and and, and our, some article I just read, uh, I'm, I'm reading an article that's about 10 pages long, but I, I, it was written by some man that said, is Jesus alive? And, and then in the course of that, he talks about uh, the, all the exciting things that Jesus did. 
took a loaf of bread and fed, uh, fed all these people. That's pretty exciting. If I'd have been there that day, I'd have been pretty excited. He took a loaf of bread and he got everybody fed. And, and there was a bunch of stuff left over. Uh, it, it wasn't so uh, exciting. It was exciting in that this happened. But what was the point? What, what is the point? What's the point of having an empty tomb? What is the point of, of the resurrection? What is the point of the ascension? What is the point? What's the point? The point is that now becomes my responsibility to share that message and that truth with my world. Resurrection gave courage to conquer. The power over sin and death. Again, the majority, uh, with minority with God is always victorious. Somehow, in my world, we've got to get away from, and I'm, I don't go from here saying the preacher doesn't like programs. I didn't say that. But we've got to get away from the idea that a new program will make everything happen right. I, I don't know if I ever told you the story. I was sitting in a General Assembly meeting in Anderson, Indiana, probably 45 years ago now, and the pastor of the, of the church in Washington, D.C., Dick Hart was a, a young preacher at the time, uh, as I was young, and we were about the same age. Uh, Dick sat there, and he had been known to have kind of a, a quick wit and always saying something kind of off the cuff. He'd just say something. And uh, somebody got up and said, we had the Board of Christian Education nationally has got a new program, and they're going to institute this new program in the church and, and everybody wanted everybody to get on board and to do this and do that. And Dick Hart, when they when everything stopped, Dick just stood up. And he said, that's just what we need is another program and sit down. Well, the message was loud and clear. The program is not going to get it done. A, a, a thought process of the resurrection is not going to get it done. The thought process of the ascension is not going to get it done unless it has an effect on me, unless I say, okay, okay, now I've got to do this. I've thought about this for 60 years, people. I, I, I have met thousands, I, probably at least thousands of preachers that can preach out, preach me any day of Carolina, probably 35 years ago now. And um, I was excited about doing that. And there was a couple of preachers there that knew me quite well. And they came to me just before I got up to preach. And they said, do you know who's going to be here today? I said, well, I hope God's going to be here. I, well, you know, that's, that sounds religious. That sounds pretty good. Uh, they said, Dr. Dale Oldham is going to be here in that service today. Dr. Dale Oldham, in my eyes, and in the eyes of many of us, was probably one of the greatest preachers that was ever put in the pulpit. Somehow the Lord spoke to me at that moment. And this boy said to me, this friend of mine said to me, he said, does that scare you? For whatever reason, I said, no, it doesn't scare me. You know who he is? I said, yeah, I know who he is. I know one other thing. God has asked me through these brethren to preach to them today. If he'd have wanted Dale Oldham to do it, he was going to be there, he'd ask Dale Oldham to do it. Could I preach like Dale Oldham? No, 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 no. There, that wasn't even, that wasn't it. But I had to get up there and do what I believe God wanted me to do. It is important. It was important to the early church. And it, it should be important to us in the 21st century church. That God didn't call us to minister back there. He didn't call us to minister somewhere else. He called us to minister here. In today's world, right where we are, he has called us to minister. And, 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 and they, they were given power uh, when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Um, they were a minority in their world. But with God, they were a majority. 
uh, they could conquer in Jehovah's might. Uh, and and I've, I've watched many, many things down through these 60 years when, when I, I, I would have, was tempted to say, why don't so-and-so do this? Uh, but that wasn't their call. It was my call. Uh, Moses was asked by God to deliver the children of Israel to go in and get them out of Egypt and do the job with them. And Moses could have said, whoops, wait a minute. Whoa, you got the wrong boy. Uh, Moses, he did say, you got the wrong one. I, I'm, I'm not sure I can do this. I, I don't know how to talk. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do something else. Um, no, I want you to do it. I'll send your brother, but you need, to, you need to understand that if your brother goes and helps you, he's going to get part of the blessing. You're not going to get it all. And I don't mean that we ought to seek to get all the blessing, but I'm talking about making sure that we do what we are called upon to do when we're called upon to do it. I had a, 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 a 50th anniversary wedding service yesterday evening. And, and I didn't think about it 50 years ago. It, it didn't even dawn on me that, that, that this was going to be 50 years later I was going to do this again. But I, but I thought about it as I approached the day yesterday, as I approached the time yesterday. I thought, you know, there was no way that I could have uh, foreseen uh, what would happen if I performed that ceremony the first time. Uh, they were just two people that I had... I really didn't know them very well at the time. Don't know them well now, but I, I sure didn't know them then. But as a result of that ceremony, there has been two or three other ceremonies along the way that I've had an opportunity to minister in God's name to other people. Had I not done it, had I said, no, 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 Cecil, I can't do that. No, 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 you just get somebody else. Uh, there's no telling what would have happened. I, I wouldn't have had other opportunities to minister. Uh, it, it becomes my responsibility and your responsibility to do what you find at your hand to do. And the Bible says do it with all your might. Give it everything you got. That day as I walked into the pulpit, I told the preacher when I walked up onto that platform, he said, how do you feel? I said, you don't understand. This is the worst mistake you've ever made in your life. And I'm about to make the worst mistake I've ever made, but I'm going to do it because you have pushed me to do it. Thirty minutes later, there wasn't a dry eye on a crowd and it wasn't one, I didn't have a dry eye either. And I walked walk off that platform and that preacher said to me, okay, tell me now, how do you feel? I had to tell him, my whole direction of my life had changed in a matter of 30 minutes. And it had all come because he pushed me into that pulpit and said, you got to do something. Just do something. After Easter what? For the early church, uh, it, 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 it meant that they could be victorious and they could show others how to be victorious. The last point of this message this morning is the church today. The church is made up of all the redeemed people. The church, uh, we are disciples. We are witnesses. We must have a message. We must have a true message. Uh, when a witness goes into court, they, they, they want a true message. They want a true announcement of what you know or what you don't know. It, it, I, I, I bring this up every time because I was called upon to be at a trial of a young man many, many years ago now. Um, oh my goodness, it was a long time ago. That was 45 years ago, sure enough. And um, I had been subpoenaed by both the prosecution and, uh, and about the, uh, uh, the other side, anyway. Uh, I, I, had been, I had been approached about witness for them. I had to go talk to each attorney. I went in and talked to the attorney for the prosecution and he questioned me a little bit and dismissed me. I went to the other side uh, 
and, and, and he questioned me and dismissed me. And I said to somebody outside, why in the world did they do that? And this is important. Both of them dismissed you because they knew you were going to tell absolutely the truth. And they didn't want you to tell the truth. Neither side. I was not going to be preferential in who I was talking about. I was going to say, this is what I know. My world is not looking for a superman or a superwoman or a super child. My world is looking for somebody that will be a witness that tells the truth, that shares with them the good news that Jesus came from that grave that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's making intercession for us and he's willing to seek and to save every lost individual in this world. It don't make a difference who they are, what color they are, how much education they got, how much money they got. We're not talking about money and education and color. We're talking about a soul that needs the Lord. We as individuals, as a church, have a message. The pew is as great as the pulpit, someone said. A layman as great as the minister. Our responsibility and our privilege. We, we, we are not forced to do. Paul said, uh, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Uh, Paul didn't claim to be the greatest preacher in the world. Felt like he had a pretty good background, but he figured out that his background didn't amount to much. But he did have a message. Uh, he had been redeemed and he had a message to share. Our message is the same as Peter's message. Uh, for the crowd at Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Personally and nationally. Uh, somehow, we as the people of God need to line up with God uh, and, and to, to accomplish what he wants accomplished in our world. Not what we want accomplished. Not how many people we've reached. Not how much... How, much church, how many church buildings we built, not how many uh, exciting things the church has done, programs that we've done, and I'm not opposed to programs. The message is a message of obedience to God, one of faith, not of doubt. After Easter is when the message is needed. We get excited about certain religious days but the most excitement should register when we can say, Jesus Christ is alive and he wants to intercede for you and me and he wants to share with the world the good news that Jesus cares. The questions that I wrote down is, have you accepted the message? Have you been redeemed? Are you carrying the message? If you cannot answer either or both of these questions with yes, then why not begin today? Uh, I, 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 I've had, in, in my lifetime, I've, had, I've run across the path of many, many young people, uh, women and, and men, uh, that, that have had, they, they were going to do something sometime. Some, some, they, they would never, never want you to think that, they, that they've stopped. They're going to do something down the road. The disciples had done about all they knew to do, and they felt like they were stopped. But Jesus said, I'm going to go, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to go, and I'm going to send a comforter. I'm going to go. Well, what, what are you doing all that? Because you have a task to perform. After Easter, what? Get up and go. Let's get the job done. My world is looking for people who are real. Uh, there, are, there are so many people in my world that I know of that never made a name for themselves. They never got their name in lights. They didn't, they never made millionaires. They were never millionaires. They were not, they were not over and over and over again, all of these things. But they ministered in the name of God, the name of Jesus, to everybody they talked to. They shared the good news. Uh, not in a preaching fashion, but in a sharing fashion. 
This is what we as the people of God in this place need to just share with those around us that Jesus cares. He is alive and well at the right hand of the Father. Shall we pray? Our Father, we're thankful again today that you have called us to be your people in this 21st century. As this century is now just getting underway, we pray that you might help us to know our responsibility to share with others the good news that Jesus is alive and well. How grateful we are for all that you've done for us, for what you can and will do for us as we rely upon you in the days that are ahead. We pray in Jesus' name.